And my name is Harlan Krumholtz. I'm a professor of medicine at the Yale University School of Medicine. I'm a cardiologist. I wrote an open letter to the adult treatment panel, the group that's putting together the new guidelines for high cholesterol with Rod Hayward of the University of Michigan, published it in Circulation, Cardiovascular Quality and Outcomes. LDL, low lipoprotein um, cholesterol, is the carrier of cholesterol, one of the carriers in cholesterol. It's one of five different lipoprotein classes. These are proteins, substances in the blood, which help ferry the fats in the blood to different places. Many studies have demonstrated this relationship between LDL and risk. It turns out, though, that it's not one of the strongest of all those substances in the blood that are carrying around cholesterol or, or even the total cholesterol measurement of the fats themselves. There was a large study that was published a couple years ago in JAMA that took together a large number of epidemiologic studies with almost 100,000 participants and was looking at the predictive ability of various different substances in the blood that relate to the carrying around fats or fats themselves. And LDL, while demonstrated to be important and everyone expected that, they also found that other measures of fats, uh, other substances in the blood were in fact, uh, in some cases, even stronger predictors. So it, it's not the singular predictor in the blood, it's one of many that confer risk, that convey to us what the risk of an individual is. Uh, also HDL itself, uh, non-HDL cholesterol, which would include uh, LDL, um, some of the substances within, a uh, substance called ApoB, which is a substance within LDL. Uh, there are others as well that uh, also confer risk, and, and like I said, in some cases, even better than LDL itself. In, in medicine, sometimes we seek ways to find out information about drugs faster than, than we might otherwise, waiting around for uh, events, waiting around to see whether or not giving people drugs uh, actually reduces heart attacks and death. And one way that we do that is to see whether or not interventions that we make, like with drugs, can lower risk factors. The problem is that not every case of lowering risk factors actually lowers a patient's risk. We are fairly confident that at very high levels of LDL, uh, it occurs sometimes in genetic disorders, that lowering it uh, through a variety of means, uh, including uh, plasmapheresis, can lower someone's risk. We know that these very high levels can be dangerous. But in levels that are more common in the population, what we're coming to appreciate is that there may be drugs that lower LDL, but they can't always confidently predict whether or not patients actually benefit as a result. That is that their risk of heart attacks and their risks of death reduce as you might expect. There are lots of reasons for this. It may be that drugs which do show that lowering LDL and lowering risk actually do so through another mechanism. That is, they're lowering LDL, but they have other beneficial effects besides lowering LDL, and so there's an appearance that it's through the LDL mechanism. It may be that lowering LDL is quite good, but it depends whether or not the drug itself does not have offsetting negative effects, such that in providing the benefit by lowering LDL, it's not offsetting that benefit by causing harm by some other mechanism. Most drugs that we give have, who knows, thousands of effects on the body. And it's difficult to predict with any sort of precision exactly what's going to happen when somebody takes these medications. And so that's why we have to do trials. And increasingly, we're finding that the trials that show that a risk factor profile improves, when we do a, a trial that's measuring actually events, what happens to patients, how they feel, whether they live, are yielding results that are in contrast to what we might expect. The prototypical one was a, a, a drug that was produced by Pfizer, torcetrapib, that raised HDL, that good cholesterol, everyone expected that to be a terrific thing, and actually lowered LDL. So it lowered LDL by 25%, uh, raised HDL by 50%. People thought that these individuals would be benefiting in a, to a great extent. But fortunately, that study was designed to test whether people uh, were able to avert heart attacks and survive uh, as a result of getting this medication. And paradoxically, there was an increase in death rates. And this was a very sobering study. This was a study that went against all expectations. Pfizer had a great big bet on this drug as a block, future blockbuster for them. And many of us in cardiovascular field had great hopes for this drug. 
And the fact that it went in a different direction than the risk factor profile was sobering and suggested and indicated and reinforced to us the importance of recognizing that all these drugs have a, a real spectrum of effects. And that the question is, do the good effects outweigh the bad effects? And is there a net benefit for patients? And it reminded us that there may be no shortcuts to finding out that information, that we really have to study patients in a way that we know what happens when they take the meds. We can't confidently predict it just based on the fact that uh, a handful of risk factors seem to improve. We can't just infer that patients are going to benefit as a result of that. Well, for years there have been recommendations around getting people to focus on their cholesterol targets, the Know Your Number campaign. Uh, when people go into the office, uh, they are often asking for the cholesterol to be drawn because they want to know their number. They equate this with risk, and uh, oftentimes the treatment strategies are all built around getting people to a certain number. The interesting thing about this is, is this grew up within national consciousness in public service announcements through uh, the nonprofit organizations like the American Heart Association. As everyone embraced this, there was a, a lack of recognition that actually none of the trials were designed to test this idea of going to target. And so this has uh, sort of, I think, led to a uh, pause by many experts to say, you know, maybe this push towards targets was misplaced. And we, uh, in this open letter, Rod Hayward and I, and also in an article that we published with other colleagues that looked at what might be the best way to, to target cholesterol uh, treatments, uh, and in particular to target statins, uh, showed that we would be better off taking a look at patients' risk because low-risk individuals have little to gain from further reduction in risk with statins and still incur many of the potential harms of the drug. And statins, like, like all drugs, have potential adverse effects. So those that have little to gain have uh, the greatest chance that the adverse, potential adverse effects of statins will offset any benefit. Those with the highest risk of heart disease, those most likely to die from heart disease have the most to gain from a reduction in risk. And in that case, and the studies seem to suggest this, that they have the, the most gain, their net benefit is most prominent. Now the decision is always the individual who's taking the medications. But they, we, what we tried to say was, you could treat fewer people and save more lives by targeting higher risk individuals. And then for an individual making the decision whether they want to take statins, the question really is, is this something that's going to be beneficial for me? Am I likely to benefit knowing that, that most people who take statins actually don't benefit? That is, it's reducing risk. So you may save an event or two, that is a heart attack or two, for every 100 people who take the medication, maybe one in 50 for higher risk groups. But a lot of people don't benefit, and a lot of people aren't harmed either. But, but the question is, do you want to put yourself in a position for the potential harms if the benefit is not that great? So we. Our open letter to the committee was, maybe there should be some rethinking and less emphasis on the idea of driving people to a particular target and more emphasis on an assessment of individual risk. And if I'm at high risk for heart disease, then I have more to gain from taking a pill like a statin. And that needs to be put into context for me, not simply told, hey, you came in and your cholesterol level is high and you need to take a drug that's going to reduce it to a level that we think is the right level. Recently, there's been a lot of discussion about adverse effects of statins, particularly around diabetes. We've yet to, to really understand what kind of harm risk is conferred by that increased risk of diabetes, whether or not people are pushed up a little bit and the risk is not that great, or whether it confers a bigger risk. But the principle is the same. You know, These drugs, like all drugs, have some risk, and the point is that you want to make sure that the people who are taking them are those who have the most to gain. And, and when individuals are making decisions, if you are deciding whether to take a statin, what you want to be sure about is, is that there is a likelihood of a real benefit for you. And the benefit for the people who take statins is going to be in people who've got a risk of cardiovascular disease, either through their family history, through their behaviors, uh, um, through their um, 
to whether they have diabetes already. And for those who are at higher risk, there's going to be more benefit to, uh, for them, more likely benefit ahead, and those are the people that should be taking it. People who are at low risk, it could be that those harms are going to offset that risk, and that should give people second thoughts about it.